Well, greetings, dear friends. It's good to have you with us for our Monday night Bible classes, or excuse me, our Wednesday night Bible classes. Uh, I was sitting here thinking about the Monday night open forum that we had uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, uh, and now, now it's Wednesday. So this is our Wednesday night Bible class, and we welcome you to these classes. I trust that you're able to be with us on a regular basis. This, these classes go uh, throughout the Lord's body and around the world. And I always make an announcement because we have new folks finding us, new believers finding us continually, and in many cases they're in different countries. And therefore I make the announcements each time uh, that uh, these classes are being brought to you by the facilities of the Midwest Center for Truth here in Northwest Arkansas in the Ozark Mountains and very close to the little town of Leslie, Arkansas. Uh, all of these classes are a ministry of the CMI Bible Research Center located here on the campus and a production of CMI Audio Video Network System being brought to you today through Ustream and YouTube. So may the Lord bless you as you join with us in these studies. Now, in these Wednesday night Bible classes that I am doing, we uh, are dealing with the Feast of the Lord. The Feast of the Lord. And uh, these classes as well as going out live are obviously recorded uh, so that if you miss the live class you can certainly uh, find the recording class uh, and catch up with what we've been talking about uh, on our website and we welcome you of course to do that at any time. We have been dealing with the Feast of Passover the Feast of Pentecost, and now we're dealing with the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of the seven month, Seventh Month. Uh, that feast that gathers, as it were, all of the other feasts up into itself. And as the seventh month is the last month of, of what is called the uh, spiritual year, uh, not the civil year, but uh, the spiritual year, or the sabbatical time period uh, for Israel. So we're in the seventh month, and we're dealing with the first part of this threefold feast, which makes up the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, it is called the day, the feast, of the day of the blowing of trumpets. We've been talking about that for some time. We, in these classes, are bringing the reality of these feasts right into the very person of the Lord Jesus. Since all of these feasts are given of God, they're His feast. Leviticus 3 says they're my feast. And they are a, a holy day, a holy uh, convocation unto the Lord. And he makes them to be that unto Israel as well. And they are a testimony given of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we gather these up into the very, finding their very, well, their very substance. Very often we use the word fulfillment. But, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, except 
there are those in the Christian community, theologians of the Christian community, ministers, that seem to insist that there are certain parts or all of these feasts that have not yet been fulfilled. Uh, which is impossible since they're a testimony of Jesus Christ and since he is not simply a fulfillment of something that was used of God to testify of him under the Old Covenant and Old Testament dispensation. More than that, Christ is the substance of everything of which these feasts testify. He is the substance. Therefore, with the coming of Christ cometh the substance himself. And, and I'm fine by calling that a fulfillment, but it, it's, it's, it's more than just a fulfillment in that he is the very substance of what the day of the blowing of the trumpets is about. He is the very substance of what the Day of Atonement is about. And he is the very substance of what the Feast of the Booths is about. All of that comes to be fulfilled in the person of Christ himself. And hon, our salvation is nothing less and nothing other than that very Christ of God, that very eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ the Lord, dwelling in you by His Spirit. And in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Him is gathered together all things given of God, spoken of God, intended of God, in heaven and in earth. In Him is a new creation. There is no point to continue to look into this creation, this, when I say this creation, I mean the creation of sight and sound. I mean the natural creation that I can look out through the windows of this building. There's no point to continue to look there when in fact, if any man be in Christ, a whole new creation, he is a new creation. For in that creation, the new is now come. So, I say that very often in these sessions because uh, there are, I, I know for a fact, there are folks who, who are just beginning to come with us in these sessions. And uh, I want us to understand that we are not looking simply in a historical vein at what these feasts uh, were in history, though we, though we take that into account and we take, that in, we take that into the Scripture. But what we're interested in is finding the substance of these feasts in the person of Christ Himself, in the indwelling person of Christ Himself. And with this, this first feast of the seventh month, uh, the day of the blowing of the trumpets, we are looking at what is gathered up into the person of Christ as the voice of God. For it certainly stood for and represented at that day the voice of the Lord. 
And as we have said, it was heard throughout the land. What a tremendous sound that must have been. Um, but we're bringing that inwardly. We're bringing it inwardly. I, I wrote down here, the voice has moved from the outside in types and shadows to the inward reality of our salvation. The voice of the Lord. We're not talking now about words. This, this, even on this feast day, even on this feast day, uh, the trumpet uh, of the trumpets, uh, the sound was, was very distinct from any other time. It was distinctly the call to the great day of atonement. So there was, a, there was a distinction about this sound. And when we're talking about the voice of the Lord, once again, we're not talking about words. If you want to look at Mount Sinai in Hebrews, uh, where it is that you have not come to that mountain that burned with fire, Mount Sinai, nor to the voice of trumpets are the sound of words. But you have come to Mount Zion. Our gospel is not given of God to us by words or in words. Our gospel is revealed in us in the person of the Word of God. God revealing His Son in our souls. Not only enlightening the eyes of our understanding by the very spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, but opening our ears to hear the voice or the living word of God. Not as we hear words, and that's something that many folks can't get a hold of. Not as we hear words, but as we hear inwardly the Word Himself, who is the answer to all of the words here of the testimony, who is the answer to all that these words declare, but who also is the very substance behind these words, the very substance hidden as a mystery in these words, as the very substance which is both the food and the drink of our soul. For he is both the food and the drink. He is both the flesh and the blood. He is both the water and the bread that is spoken of in the scripture. It is Christ. It is Christ. And that's what this term voice is all about. Now, under the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament, it has many types and shadows. Sometimes it was like the voice of thunder. Sometimes it was like the voice of rain. Sometimes it was like the voice of a storm. Sometimes it was like the voice of a whisper. With Israel, it was sounded forth in the sound of trumpets. 
uh, mostly and mainly the shofar, which is what it is in relation to the feast, the gatherings, was by the sounding of the ram's horns. But there were also two other trumpets that were constructed, not out of ram's horns, and they had a distinct sound to them as well. All of this is a type and shadow of the voice of the Lord, whose voice is spirit and life. I will tell you this, in your soul, you know it when you hear it. Just like in your soul, you know Him when you see Him. When God reveals the Son in you, you know it. Because He opens the eyes of your understanding to see Him. It's not an image you see, but a reality of the eternal one dwelling in you that you see. But you both hear and see the Lord. Now that is a fact. And those who have come to see Christ in that inward way, know what I'm talking about. Paul's prayer was that every believer would come to know him in that way. Why? Because he is in you. Then Paul's prayer was that you know him in that inward way. God revealing his son in me is Paul's great statement concerning what he meant by my gospel come but came but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is that? God revealing His Son in me. Not, not, not some revelation about Jesus Christ. God revealing His Son, Jesus Christ, in me. Seeing Him the very person, the very eternal spirit, the very substance of our salvation, consequently the very substance of our soul, the very life of our soul. Such is the voice, such is the voice. I was thinking about this yesterday and on my way here to the research center today, just uh, I only live about three miles from here down a county road. And when I got here, I, I, I turned to Genesis 3 and 8 because I want to talk to you about, we're in talking now about the voice of the Lord. And we're not talking about some outward sound, we're talking about the voice of the Lord in you. In you. Uh, Genesis 3 and 8. Unfortunately, these verses are, uh, are, these verses are about an unfortunate incident, and that is uh, the, uh, the sin of Adam and Eve, the disobedience of Adam and Eve, uh, the believing of the lie, the eating, as it were, of the lie of Adam and Eve. And... Let me just read here. They had sown fig leaves together. They, had, they saw their own nakedness. Their eyes was opened. Not as the lie said it would be. Their eyes were opened to their self. They got no great understanding of God here. They got no great understanding of good here. They got, they, their eyes was opened to themselves. They saw themselves as God knew them to be. They saw themselves naked. They saw self. S-E-L-F. And they had never done that before. 
What they had seen before was not self. They'd seen one another, but in a way that was not self-centered at all. They had seen the creation, the center of which God had made them to be. They had great knowledge of that creation, of all of it. So much so that God brought the various animals of it to Adam that he might give them names. His view was of that creation. And that's a wonderful testimony there before the fall because it finds its fulfillment, its fullness, its substance in Christ himself who certainly knows the Lord, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Yes, for he lives in them. He certainly knows his creation. He has named it. He has written his name in it. Well, we're not going any further down that, down that line. But all of this has been lost with Adam. And they heard, verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That is the late, uh, the, the beginning of the evening. The beginning of the evening. In the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And we're not reading any further than that because this particular thing is not what we're talking about. Except verse 10, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. It wasn't the voice of the Lord that scared him. It was his nakedness. Oh, well, I would like to stay with that. And I hid myself. But hon, you can't hide your self from the voice of the Lord. Now, I just want to look at the voice. So I was looking at some commentators it's amazing, it's amazing the various theories, theological theories, and even some poetical, I mean, even get poets wrapped up in this. What it says about the voice of the Lord. But the best commentators agree, and I'm going to just read very, just, this, just this paragraph. Um, According to the scriptural usage rendered, they heard the voice of the Lord God sounding in the garden. At the same time, we prefer the translation adopted in our own version of this passage which is moreover sanctioned by the approval of the best and most influential commentators, both ancient and modern. This, says Faber, this is the sense in which the passage is explained by the Targumist, the Targumist, because they agree to render it, they all agree to render it, 
They heard the word of the Lord God walking. They heard the word of the Lord God walking. The prophet also, in the precise phraseology of Moses, calls this being, capital B-E-I-N-G, this being, the voice of the Lord. The prophet Isaiah also, in the precise phraseology of Moses, calls this being the voice of the Lord in Isaiah 30, verse 30 and 31. Well, reading in Isaiah 30, verse 30 and 31, we read, And the Lord shall cause His glorious voice to be heard, Better said, better said, and the Lord shall cause the voice of his glory to be heard and shall show the lightning down of his arm with the indignation of his anger with the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering and tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And it goes on. But here Isaiah distinguishes the voice of his glory to be the same as the Lord himself. It is not so much a being, it is not so much a being speaking words as it is the being of the eternal word of God. Doing certain things. Doing certain things. It is the same that we'll read in some of our other verses that John said when he said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. He didn't say, I turned to see the man whose voice I heard, or I, heard, I turned to see who was talking. I turned to see the voice, the person of the Word. I turned to see the voice who spake with me. I turned to see the voice which I heard. I turn to see him. There is always that with those who truly hear the voice. Now I'm bringing this inward now. It was the same way outwardly, but I'm bringing this inwardly. It's always the same way. When in an inward way we hear the voice, we hear the sound of the person, we turn in our hearts and our souls to see Him in His glory because it is the voice of glory that we hear where it is spoken of here in the King James as, as the glorious voice. It is actually the voice of His glory in a, a better translation. But whatever translation it is in, it is speaking of the same being that Moses was speaking of. The same being. It shouldn't, it, 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 it shouldn't uh, uh, surprise us to know that it was the Word of God Himself that met with Adam and Eve in the garden. Since 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And, and there was nothing done without Him. But in the garden, it is all outward. And that's my whole point here. This wasn't a, a lightning flash. This wasn't a storm that had entered the garden. This wasn't a great and mighty wind. Not here in the garden. I, I'm using this. I felt just a real strong urge coming up here to go to look at these verses in Genesis. No, it is... It is in the very best Targums, in the very best, well, in all of the Targums, in fact, they all agree, and in the very best translations, it is a being. The voice that they heard was the very being. And they heard this being walking in the garden, the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord. Well, Han, again, this Israel hears this voice, but they hear it in, in very they they hear it in 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 what is uh, given of God to them uh, in various types and shadows. Primarily, however, through the blowing of the trumpets the blowing of the trumpets. In the garden, under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, and, and in the Old Testament writings, the voice of the Lord truly has many functions and, and is heard in many different ways. I think the Hebrew writer in chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, says that and just gathers all of this up that we're talking about in those verses. Because there, as you well know, he says, uh, and I'd like to just for clarity's sake, just turn and read that. Uh, Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That is true. Hath at the end of those days. That's the better translation. The King James says, hath in these last days. Not shall when the last days come, because there's so many. It's unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable that so many preachers in Christianity of some form or another are still looking for the last days to come. Hun, the last days spoken about in the Bible have already come because they weren't talking about the planet blowing up or disappearing at all. They were talking about a change, a complete and total, absolute change of administration, of salvation. Coming from the administration of angels, coming from the administration of the law of sin and death, coming from the administration identified with Moses in Mount Sinai, coming from the administration of the letter and the law to the administration of the Spirit. But it wasn't just a changeover, it was a doing away with the one and a coming forth in power of Spirit 
the exceeding greatness of his power of the other. The administration of the fullness of the times that were given of God in Israel. We're talking about one of those times. The blowing, the, the feast of the day of the blowing of the trumpet was one of those times. But God, through the administration of the fullness of the times, gathering everything, summing up is the actual word there in Ephesians chapter 1, 9 and 10. The summation up, summing up of all these things in Christ. A whole new administration. The word there. Is, is, is in the King James called dispensation, but dispensations end with the coming of the administration of the fullness of the times. The word in the original is administration. It's the administration of the Spirit of God. It's the administration whereby Christ is in you. It's the administration in which we find the new creation in Christ Jesus. It is not another dispensation. It is the end of that and the introduction of a new creation in Christ to which there is no end. And it is in that creation that we're not hearing trumpets or drums or voices, but the one voice of the Lord. He hath spoken in Son, the Son who is His eternal Word. And hun, that's how he speaks to our souls. Now, I am very obviously speaking to you in words. It's the reason that I so often say it's not my words. that I want you to hear. It is the Word. And I trust that He is found throughout my words, just like He is found throughout the Scripture. But my desire for you, believer friend, is that this Word be revealed in you of the One who gave Him to you, God, our Father. Because it is in Him that God hath spoken. He is the Word, the voice of God. Not the Word of words, not the voice of words. Oh no, it's much more than that. It is the understanding of the Lord being given, the wisdom of God being imparted, the knowledge of the Most High being impregnated in your very soul. This is what the knowing of Christ is all about that Paul teaches that you may know Him. Oh, that I may know Him. And His prayer is that you may know Him. He calls it the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what He's after. He wants to hear the voice. He wants to see the face. He wants the glory of that of that Lord, the glory of that voice, the glory of that face, to fill his very heart 
and soul. Once again, once again, Hebrews 1. Whether it is Paul who wrote this letter or another is of no consequence to us right now. Hath at the end of those days spoken in Son. Again, King, King James says, spoken to, unto us by his Son. But the original translation says, who hath spoken in Son. Has spoken in Son. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he hath made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. My, my, I won't read any more. It's Christ, honey. It's Christ in you. This great administration of the Spirit, this great salvation of which all of this was indeed a type, a shadow, a testimony, and still is a testimony. Still is. Because that of which and he of whom it is a testimony has not come and gone. No. But is eternal. Our salvation is eternal. He who is the substance and person and being of that salvation liveth in you. He is eternal. Oh, the joy of our hearts to hear his voice and to turn and see his face. Paul speaks about this well, he, it, throughout all of his epistles. But one of the places that I think it's just said in the very clearest of words that he could use. And, and you know, I say it very often, Paul just continually exhausted his vocabulary, and his vocabulary was a large, large, large vocabulary. I mean, honey, he could stand, he could stand on the mount of the unknown God and talk to them about their poets. He was an extremely learned man with an extreme vocabulary, and yet he exhausted that vocabulary trying to use superlatives to measure the greatness of Christ in you, and he couldn't do it. But he continued to try, asking them to pray that God would give him utterance that he might speak the mystery of God as he should speak it. But you see, words can't get it done, hon. Huh? Nobody's words. And yet in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, Paul says, For God, and then comma, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, speaking of both the creation and also as, as it really should be because it speaks of the creation, then he brings it right into the Ark of the Covenant, which certainly is a symbol of a creation, new though it may be, in Christ. But it was, the Ark was setting in darkness, and the only light that God would permit there was the light of His glory, filling that chamber. It has to be with reference to that as well as the creation that we were reading about a while ago that Paul is speaking when he says, but look at what he says. 
This is what will blow you away if you have a mind, if you have a, if you, if you, if you have a heart to even know or an ear to hear, a desire spiritually. This will blow you away. Read it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. I, I would ask that you start with verse 1, read up to it. In fact, well, I'll have you to go all the way back to the first of the book, but God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, God hath shined. Notice, God hath shined. It's the shining of God, the shining of the glory of God. But look where, look where. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in, that is from within, in our hearts to give, to give, to give unto us inwardly, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face, which is translated as the forward part, the part that Moses could not see, the person, the face, the person of Jesus Christ. Hun, God revealing His Son in you, in me. That we may come to know Him, see Him, hear Him, because in knowing Him, we are knowing, we are seeing, we are hearing our salvation. The beginning of Israel's journey, the message of the Lord was tell them to stand still and behold the salvation of the Lord. Well, that salvation was not fully set forth in type and in shadow, except by Solomon in the finished temple. It started right there. What they saw there was the destruction of Egypt. It's a lot more than that to our salvation. And the Lord continued to set that before them in types and shadows in many ways, all of which were a type of Christ himself. Finally coming to Solomon, that type of the Lord in his glory and that glory filling the temple. Honey, is Christ in you. Well, my whole purpose today was to simply say that this voice, the voice of the Lord, must be considered as the proper designation of the being, B-E-I-N-G, who appeared to our first parents. I have no problem with the Lord appearing to them. I have no problem with, with the Son appearing to them, understanding it was an appearing that was outward and not inward. Outward and not inward. Well, it is now inward rather than outward. We are His body. Now who should hear His voice save His body? Now, I've just got a couple of minutes here, but I, I want you to think about it with me. We, we can think about it. Just look at it in the natural for a second. When you speak, 
or I'll, I'll make it personal with me, but it fits everyone one way or another. When I speak, I'm not just grabbing thoughts written on the wall here or written in a book or written anywhere, really. I am verbalizing a thought. A thought that I could say, even in the natural, in an inward way, if you, I'm trying to just show you something that I heard. I heard a thought. And I try to verbalize that thought. Now, I'm limited by whatever voca whatever, uh, whatever uh, 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 vocabulary I have. There, there may be someone have that same thought and put it in different words concerning their vocabulary. And their vocabulary may be less than mine or greater than mine or whatever. You understand? But that, that is still natural, and yet it is, we voice it in words. Now, we don't have such a problem voicing natural thoughts in words. But when God reveals His Son in me, the thought ceases to be natural. And only the Spirit can discern the difference. The Spirit that is in the believer, the Spirit that is in me. If that believer is sensitive to the Spirit, and if that believer is actually seeing Christ. Otherwise, that believer has a soul that's filled with natural thoughts. And he's trying to express spiritual things, not only with natural words, but with natural thoughts of his heart and mind. And that doesn't work. So what the revealing of Christ does, Han, is it brings our soul from natural thoughts to the thought of the Spirit Himself. Now, the problem with that is that when it comes through my mouth, it still is spoken in natural words. So I take caution to say that the scripture is written and translated in natural words that are speaking of spiritual things. And if we can receive that, then we're in good shape. But if we try to make the letter itself spiritual, then we get in trouble. The letter speaks of that which is spiritual. And I'm not telling you that there is, that I have a knowledge beyond the scripture. I'm not telling you that at all. I'm telling you that you can only truly understand the scripture by the thought, by the thought of the spirit. He will show you the true meaning of the word that is there. Maybe to get into some of these things just it causes more confusion, but I hope that it doesn't. What I would have you to seek is to see Him. Father, here the words are. They're true words, there are words, but they are speaking of something that I can't get a hold of because I try to get a hold of what these words are saying through a natural means and in a natural way and understand them in a natural setting. And that's our problem, isn't it? Well, the only answer to that, to that problem is not to change the scripture and not to try to change the scripture or not to try to say, well, the scripture is no good. We don't need the scripture. Oh, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. 
Well, we have an understanding beyond the Scripture. No, you don't. You've got some kind of a wild-haired imagination that the devil can just really have a heyday with. What we need, hon, is to see Christ because these are they which testify of Him. We can understand this is the testimony of Him, but to understand the testimony, we must go to the person. The person that is in you. That's your new birth. The Spirit of truth is yearning to reveal that person. And in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the testimony will come alive. I'm talking to you about the voice. That's what I'm talking about. So we will continue because there's other verses here that relate to the voice that I want us to look at as well. It's good to be with you in this manner uh, and with some of you uh, uh, face to face from time to time. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing uh, many of you in September uh, in our Bible conference there in Tazewell, Virginia, uh, in the month of uh, in the month of September, and I don't have those dates here in front of me, and I forgot what they are. I announced it the other day, but I'll be announcing it several more times, and uh, I'm sure that by this time it should be on our website. Uh, it's in September, and it's the it's the first part of September. September, and I think it's something around the 8th, 9th, and 10th, or the uh, 7th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, I believe it to be very possibly the second uh, weekend uh, in September, uh, or maybe the first weekend of the first week in September, but it's the beginning of September. Look forward to seeing many of you there. I would like to see particularly all of you that are in that area of the nation. Friday night, all day Saturday, Sunday, there in Tazewell, Virginia. Now, I'll be back out in that area in October, uh, but that's, that's a different announcement and I'll hold that until then. But in Tazewell, Virginia, in uh, September, we will be having our annual gathering there. These are weekend gatherings, weekend conferences, weekend times, and uh, love to have you with us. If you have any questions concerning this, just contact us here at the Research Center, okay? And you can do that uh, through our website, and, and you can do that through our emails. You can give us a call as far as that goes. Uh, my Uh, email is, and I think it's probably listed on the website as well, but it's simple. It's jwlumen at yahoo.com. That's very simple. jwlumen, all written in lower, lower case as one word. jwlumen as one word. At yahoo.com so you can communicate in that way it's good to be with you in these Wednesday night sessions please let us know how we can be of help to you or minister to you and thank you for you who stand with us and help support this ministry in what we are doing with this gospel throughout the body of Christ and around the world. We appreciate it more than I can ever tell you. Till next time, may the Lord bless. Amen.